Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In this lecture, we are going to talk about concurrency in databases. If you recall, in the last lecture, we discussed about transactions and whether a transaction is serializable or not. And by looking at the precedence graph, we were able to figure out whether that transaction uh, can be serialized as it is or it cannot be serialized. But we did not propose any solution for those transactions that were not serializable, what to do with them. So we can just, given a transaction, we know whether it's serializable or not based on the precedence graph. But if it is not serializable, then we don't know how to you know, sort it out, how to, how to execute that transaction. So for that, we have what is called concurrency control. So concurrency control basically means that you have different transactions and you're trying to control how these transactions can be executed simultaneously. So let's start with the lecture in this. Um, the outline of the lecture is as follows. So we have what is a concurrency control and then lock based protocols, then two phase locking protocol. And then finally we have a deadlock. So uh, <coughs> we'll see we can as we'll cover as much as we can in this lecture. And if there are any left over, then we'll uh, take it to the next lecture. So the first thing is what is concurrency control? So concurrency control is, uh, if you want to define it, is the technique is used uh, to protect data when multiple users are accessing the same data concurrently is called concurrency control. So concurrency control is that technique that we are using to allow multiple users to access and modify the same uh, data. What's the purpose of concurrency control? It's to enforce isolation. When we say isolation, we are talking about isolating transaction it means one transaction is executing at a time in isolation which means that other transactions are not uh, allowed to modify whatever uh, this given transaction is trying to access in the database uh, we'll see uh, with the help of a few example in the later slides uh, so the second purpose of concurrency control is to preserve the database consistency through consistency preserving execution of transactions and to resolve the read, write and write, write conflicts that we saw in the previous lecture. So an as an example, in concurrency execution environment, if T1, a transaction T1 conflicts with another transaction T2 over a data item A, maybe A is a table, maybe A is a row or a set of rows in a given table. So if T1 conflicts with T2, what does this conflict means? It means that uh, T1 and T2 are both trying to access A at the same time. Then the existing concurrency control decides if T1 or T2 should get the A and if the other transaction is rolled back or it waits. So T1 and T2 cannot both access A at the same time. So con what concurrency control will do is it will decide uh, either one of them is going to be given precedence. Uh, for instance, T1 is given and T2 has to wait or T1 is given and T2 has to abort and roll back. So uh, to do that, we have uh, to help us uh, do this concurrency control we have what is called locks and uh, these locks are very similar to what you might have done or you may do in the operating system course you may have uh, locks there critical region and semaphores and stuff like that so it ha also happens in the operating system when you know you're trying to modify something of maybe a file or two or three programs are trying to modify a file or for instance if you have a file a word file open and then uh, another process is trying to copy uh, or overwrite this file it won't allow you because the file is already open so there, there are also uh, locks in operating system as well but in databases uh, locking is an operation which secures a permission to read or a permission to write a data item for a transaction so there are two things that we can do either a read or a write so for example if i say lock x it means data item x is locked on behalf of the requesting transaction. So T1, T2, T3, one of the transactions is want to modify the value of X. They will request that X be locked. 
it means that now they have control over x and if t1 has control over x then t2 and t3 have to either abort or wait for t1 to finish whatever it's doing and uh, when i say they have the option it means that there are different protocols and each one will allow a different setting uh, for the rest of the transactions so that is locking locking means acquiring uh, that data set for yourself and then when you're finished doing the trans operations whatever you are doing then you unlock uh, that part of the database and unlocking is the operation which removes these permissions from the data item so for instance if you say unlock x it means that data item x is now available for all other transactions to modify as they want and lock and unlock are atomic operation it means they are a single operation either it will be done or it won't be done we will see that in some cases locking requires one or more uh, operations but they are considered a single atomic operation it means either it will be logged or it won't be logged so there are two kinds of lock that we define the first one is the read lock or what we call the shared lock and the second one is the exclusive or the write lock and they're fundamentally different in the sense of what they allow for instance if transaction one is having a lock whether it's a read lock or a write lock will determine what other transactions can do with that data so for a shared uh, mode or a read lock uh, more than one transactions can apply share lock on a data x for reading its value but no write lock can be applied on x by any other transaction what this means is that if i want to read a data and i want to have a shared log or a read log then other transactions if they request that they also want to read the data they will be allowed to read the data and the reason is that because everybody is applying for a read log it means that they have no intention of modifying the data so if there are multiple transactions then none of the transaction has any intention of modifying the data they all want it in read mode which is perfectly fine uh, as we saw last time you can have read after read that's perfectly okay and therefore you can have shared log for multiple transactions at the same time however if one of the transactions want to write or update the data then that transaction will need the data x or the table x in a write log or an exclusive log when we have a write log it means only that transaction has access to the data x and the none of the other transaction can have the uh, access to that data either in read or write mode so uh, to understand it here is the conflict matrix if you have read and read then it is yes it means you are in a read mode you can have uh, you know this transaction is doing read and another transaction is doing a read that's fine yes that's allowed uh, and both of them are in the read or the shared log but if one transactions want to read and the other wants to write then that's not possible if the first transactions want to write well the other wants to read that's also not possible and if the first transaction wants to write and the other transaction wants to write that is also not possible so only read and read is possible so how are these locks managed the locks are managed by the database using what is called the lock manager and the lock manager is responsible for managing locks on the data items the way it does is it is by maintaining this table so lock manager uses it to store the identity of the transaction locking the item the data item the lock mode the pointer to the next data item and one simple way is through a link list so i have the transaction id that's trying to do the operation then data item x on which uh, you know the lock is performed the type of lock whether it's read lock or a write lock so if it's a read lock it means that if others uh, request access to x1 they will be allowed if it's a write lock it means that others will not be allowed and then the pointer to the next data item so the next data item after x1 so this is the pseudo code of how the read lock looks like so if the you know you're going to try if lock of x equal to unlock so you if a transaction wants to lock x then it will have to go through this uh, pseudo code so if lock of x was unlocked 
it means that this x uh, uh, repeated that x can be a table it can be a row or a set of rows if x is uh, it depends on whether the lock is performed at a table level or at a row level so if the lock is uh, if the lock is, sorry if the table or the row whatever x represents is unlocked then you follow this you begin you lock it in a read mode you increment the number of uh, locks by one and that's it so the lock manager knows that so if it was unlocked before the first transactions come uh, it is able to uh, lock it in the read mode and the counter for the read lock is one if a second transaction comes and it wants to read x as well then it will also lock it in the read mode and then the total number of locks will become two and so you are going to have this uh, counter uh, incremented every time somebody wants to have x in a read mode and whenever you are finished then uh, it will be decreased by one however if you want if you come and you see that it is not unlocked then it means that it is read locked if it is read log then you just increment uh, the number of read logs by one and that's it however if it is not in read log it is not unlocked it is not in read log it means that it has to be in a write log then you begin the wait process it means that uh, the transaction requesting the read mode cannot have access to read the data because somebody else has it in the write mode and because somebody else have it in the right mode it means that other transaction is trying to update the data so unless that uh, other transaction has finished updating uh, the data you cannot read the data so in that case you will go into a wait mode and until a lock x is equal to unlocked and the lookup transaction will wake the transaction so if t1 here so if i have uh, T1 here it's trying to have access to this X and there is T2 that have it it read lock then what will happen is that T1 will also get a read lock and then the read lock counter will be uh, 1 for this and 1 for this equal to 1 plus 1 which is 2 however if uh, somebody else has it in a uh, right lock so maybe transaction p3 then a t1 cannot have it unless it starts going to keep waiting and the uh, the lock manager will is going to keep an eye whenever t3 unlocks this x then it will send a message for to t1 that x is now available for you to lock it in the read mode so that is what uh, this part is, uh, this pseudo code is telling us. In the second case, uh, for the unlock, if you have locked uh, X in the right lock mode, then when you lock X, is, uh, you know, when you unlock, it becomes unlocked. Or uh, it wakes up uh, one of the transaction if anyone was waiting. So for instance, if uh, T3 had it in the right mode, and then when you unlock it, T1 was waiting on X, so the manager will going is going to send a signal or is going to uh, you know send a uh, notice to T1 that it is now available for unlock or what we call is it wakes up because it was waiting or it was in sleeping, it wakes up that transaction. Else, uh, if log X is equal to read log, then if it was simple, the case of a read log, for instance, if T2 who had it in the read log then all it's going to do is it's going to have minus one over here which will be one so when t2 releases x uh, and it was in the read log so read log counter had the value two it will just subtract one from it it means that now this is read log and this has uh, you know unlocked it so there is only one transaction that have x in a read log and this is important because when you are trying to, if T3 wants to uh, take control of X in the right mode, it will have to go and check here and it will see that at least one transaction has it in the read mode. Therefore, this cannot have it in a write mode because write is an exclusive mode. 
exclusive means that only t3 will have access to x whereas if, if we have a counter here which says 1 it means that the first transaction already have access to x and therefore t3 cannot have it in the right mode uh, sorry. So, if it is uh, read log, then you uh, you know subtract one from it, and if it becomes zero, then you write it as unlocked. So, if this gives up x, this has given up x, and this has given up x, it means that you have another minus one, which is zero, and therefore now x is un. Log. It means no transaction have access to x in any log whatsoever, whether read or write. So, <coughs> if I have something for read and I want to convert it to write, or the other way around. So, if I want to upgrade, a uh, read log is a smaller log, and the write log is the more stricter log. I won't say smaller; I would say looser and more strict. So, read log is a loose log and write lock is a strict lock so for if ti uh, transaction ti has a read lock x and tj has no read lock x where i is not equal to j it means the two transactions are different then convert read lock to write lock so if only ti had read lock and tj has did not have any read lock then read lock x can can be converted to a write lock else you are going to force ti to wait until tj unlocks x it means that as long as there is at least one read lock on x then ti cannot have an exclusive or write lock on that data so that is the condition for upgrading downgrading is easy if you had an exclusive uh, if you had a write lock it means you are the only one having that lock you don't have to go and check anybody else because if you had a write lock it automatically means that nobody else had a lock on that so you can simply downgrade it to the the, the write lock to the read lock and you don't have to tell uh, anything to anybody you don't have to check anything because you you had it in an exclusive mode so using these locks we have what is called uh, the first protocol is the lock based protocol so if a lock uh, cannot be granted the requesting transaction is made to wait till all incompatible logs held by other transactions have been released. Then the log is granted. So if you are using a log based protocol and you want to go and write something and that uh, data is being used by someone else, then you will have to go in a wait state until uh, the other transactions have released that data at least in the right mode and then you can access that data. So, for instance, if we had a transaction T1, you lock, uh, you have a shared lock, so that's a read lock on A, and then you read A, and then you unlock, and then you go and have a shared lock on B, and then you read B, and then you unlock, and then you can display A plus B. So that is fine. So, what is the problem? This looks uh, fine, you can lock it, but you know. Uh, what is the problem? So the problem comes, uh, the issues with lock based protocol is that locking as above is not sufficient to guarantee serializability. Why? If A and B get updated in between the read of A and B, then dis the displayed sum would be wrong. So it means that if you have, uh, you have read this A and then you have locked, un you, you lock A and then you read A and then you unlock A. However, in between somewhere here, another transaction T2 reads A and then writes A and it's perfectly able to do that because you know A is an, in an unlocked position. So there is no read lock, there is no write lock. So there is nothing preventing T2 from acquire, acquiring a uh, exclusive lock on A. So it can read A and write A. However, A has now the ancient value or the older value. Older value of A. And this has given a new value to A. And then you are going to have this and when you display A plus B, 
So A here is uh, going to have the older value from here and not the newer value. So this will give you the wrong answer. So even though you are using the logs, it means that at the time when A was reading, uh, sorry, the, the time when the first transaction T1 was reading A, nobody else was reading A. And then it, you know, unlocked A and then it logged B. And at the time it was reading B, nobody else was doing anything with B. So, however, at the end when you're trying to display A plus B, someone in between after you have unlocked A uh, has changed the value of A. And so by the time you display A plus B, you are having a wrong value of A and, uh, you know, it's, it's going to give you the wrong answer. So for that reason, you say that uh, there are issues with the log based protocol. So a locking protocol is a set of rules based on all transactions while requesting and releasing logs. Locking protocol restrict the set of possible schedules that you can have. So for instance, if you look at this, so if you have an exclusive lock on B and then you read B and you change uh, the value of B and then you write B and then you lock have you have a shared lock here and uh, of a and then you read a and then you lock uh, shared lock on b and this is trying to have a lock on a so neither t3 nor t4 can make any progress why because this has not unlocked b and because this is now asking for a, a shared lock on a so from here you can see that you know, if you are trying to have a, so if you are trying to have a read lock and uh, it is already locked, then what you do is else you begin the wait process. So you are waiting for that other transaction to release it so that you can have your own lock. In this case, however, uh, this transaction T3 has access to B. So transaction T4 will be waiting for T3 to release uh, B here, uh, not this one, but uh, this one. So it will be waiting for transaction T3 to release B. And because it's waiting, uh, you know, it's, it's going to go into sleep mode. And then every now and then it's checking whether uh, B has been released or not. Uh, the transaction T3, on the other hand, is trying to you know, before it commits, is trying to have an exclusive lock on A. However, T4 has a read lock on A because there's a read lock and we saw that you cannot have read and write at the same time. Only read and read is possible, but read and write or write and read or write and write, uh, the three combinations are not possible. Therefore, this is going to wait for T4 to release A. And T4 is not going to release because it's waiting for T3 to release B. So they are both waiting for one another. So neither T3 nor T4 can make progress. Executing lock, uh, the shared lock B causes T4 to wait for T3 to release its lock on B, while executing exclusive lock A causes T3 to wait for T4 to release its lock on A. Such a situation is called a deadlock, and to handle a deadlock, one of them has to roll back and release the locks. So this is a big issue with the lock based protocol and so this one is the deadlock condition and the other one is the starvation condition and in the starvation condition is also possible if concurrency control manager is badly designed. So if your manager is badly designed for instance a transaction may be waiting for an exclusive lock on an item while a sequence of other transaction requests and are granted a shared lock on the item. So transaction T1 is waiting to write on data set A. Transactions T2, T3, T4 up to T10. They are one after the other having a shared lock on A and then T1 is just waiting for them to finish and uh, you know uh, they are they just keep uh, you know reading their data and T1 never gets a chance to get its exclusive uh, uh, lock. So it's not a deadlock because all the other operations are being executed, but T1 is waiting and it's waiting indefinitely. So they, uh, T1 is in a very bad situation. We call it it's starving. It's starving because it cannot continue unless it gets its exclusive lock and it's not getting its exclusive lock. 
because T2 through T10 are having uh, the value in read mode. So concurrency manager can be designed to prevent such a starvation. So to deal with these kind of things, we do we look at what is called the two-phase locking protocol. Uh, but I think we can uh, discuss that in the next lecture.